owns the prayer that breath that we're breathing he owns the air that we're breathing he owns it <laughs> your breath he owns it glorify God in your body and in your spirit which belongs to God Glorify God, magnify God in your body. And in your spirit, which belongs to God. Just keep telling him thank you. If you're tired, you can sit down. That's okay, but we're going to just... It's okay. You're not offending nobody if you sit down. Some of you just love the connection that Holy Spirit is having with your spirit at the moment. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great. Magnificent are you, O oh God. Magnificent are you. When it comes to worshiping Jesus, there's no, it's not a moment to get shy. Not a moment to get shy. Lift up my hands, fall to my knees. I sway. I just open up my spirit. I may praise him in the spirit, praise him in tongues. Not real loud, but I would just vocally just start begin to praise him in tongues in the spirit. They may hear me right next door, but that's okay. I'm not doing it to draw attention to nobody else. It's just that I'm praising Jesus. It's Jesus. He has redeemed us with his own blood. With his own blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is your church, your people, and we praise you. We thank you, Jesus. We are like the crowd on Palm Sunday. It says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We are expressive in our worship. We're not taking our shirts off and throwing them on the floor for you to walk over, but we are throwing up our hands. We're not cutting down palm branches from the tree and throwing them in the road, but we are praising you with the gift of the Spirit that you give. We are just expressing and saying thank you over and over again. We would not dare, would not dare be like those super religious people that said Lord they're getting too emotional and you said if they were to be quiet the stones would begin to cry out thank you Jesus yes Lord 
Jesus, we do, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just one more time as we go through this, and then we'll... Yes, Jesus. Throw up our physical hands and our spiritual hands and our... We take our heart and open up our heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated. From time to time, every time they sing that song, it's his breath in my lungs. I just think it's song become more precious to me after 2017 when I had those issues and I spent nine days in ICU it is his breath in my lungs I move and live and breathe the message today comes from Acts chapter number 19 an exciting word the whole Bible is exciting you can't make up the stories that are in the Bible they're so astounding that people said that's just not real they can't happen but they did happen and they happen again and again and again and Jesus Christ wants to do them over and over again we're going to start in verse number one and read down through verse number 20. I know it's a long text, but we need to hear all of it. But I'm just going to just relay a little bit to you at the end, and then we'll go back so that you can sort of know. But we're not going to have what I'm reading to you right now. It says in there that uh, we, it says, and God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Then it speaks about seven sons of Siva who must have been in an evangelistic service with Paul one day when he was casting out some demons because we know and on another occasion that they said, in the name of Jesus, come out of them. And so they must have seen Paul do this a few times, may have seen him lay their hands on people a few times and they get well. So there were some uh, itinerant Jews that was going to make some money one day uh, using, they thought, they thought it was just in the speech. And so they got this demon-possessed man, and it must have had a group gathered there. And they was going to cast out the demon, and so they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul speaks about, and then all of a sudden the devil says, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but me and you ain't got nothing going on. And this one guy jumped on seven of them and beat the tar out of them, and it says they went out of the house naked. And so, and then it says this, and this became known to everybody. So when they make that statement this became known to everybody you get the idea they invited a crowd together to watch this <laughs> and so word spread out you don't want to play with Jesus you want to get serious with Jesus this became known to everybody who lived in Ephesus both Jews and Greeks fear and reverence fell upon everybody and the Lord Jesus was magnified and many who were believers they came confessing and just getting rid of all their stuff that they had been caught up with in sin. And they brought all that paraphernalia that they had, whether they were crack pipes, whether it was pornography, and it was magic books and all these spells, and just build them in a fire. And it says they came, and it just means they just, every week there was just a new group coming and said, I'm getting rid of it, getting rid of it, getting rid of it. And then the last verse, verse number 20, that we'll read, and I'm, uh, I'm reading this, it says, in this way the Lord's message flourished. Everybody say flourish. Don't you love it when your garden flourishes? Oh, yes, it just will flourish, and you have to work hard at it. You have to pull the weeds out, and you have to water it, and you have to fertilize it. But I don't care what kind of environment just about it's in. Your garden can flourish if you just 
fertilize it and water it. Boy, we have got some pollen in there, don't we, in this air. Makes your throat thick. Acts 19, verses 1 through 20. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul's. If you read Acts chapter 18, Paul was finishing up his evangelistic journey. This is Paul's second visit to Ephesus. And the first visit, he stopped by there maybe for just a weekend, maybe two weekends, but he was in an urgent hurry to get to Jerusalem. The Bible doesn't tell us why. But while he was there, he met this young believer named Apollos, and he only knew part of what he needed to know about Jesus. And so Priscilla and Aquila got him to one side and explained to him the way of God more thoroughly. And he turned out to be a dynamite for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he wanted to go to Acacia, which uh, was Corinth. He wanted to go there. And so he went there and he helped the church there. The Bible says powerfully. But there in Ephesus, Paul took the boat like the next week and he goes to Caesarea. Then he goes down about 90 miles till he gets to Jerusalem and he gives them an update on everything that he's done. And so he takes off again, going by the churches because being a pastor, being a shepherd, that he cares about his people, he is concerned about doctrines that are coming in because the devil has always got somebody coming in and putting bad stuff in there. So he goes back through Lystra and all these other places. He could have got in a boat and went straight up to Ephesus, but he went to all of those places. Good to get you a Bible map and just look at that. So when he gets back to Ephesus, and so Apollos is going to Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions, and he came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Wow. <laughs> then what baptism? No wow in the Bible. but <laughs> Paul said, then what baptism were you baptized with? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling people that they should believe in the one who would come after him that is in Jesus. And when they heard this, I'm sure that Paul, there was a lot, lot there we don't have written. But when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages and to prophesy. Now, there were about 12 men in all. Then he, Paul, entered the synagogue and he spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in discussion and trying to persuade them about the things of the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, but slandering the way. Everybody say, the way. Pause again right there. The way is the first terminology that people that were not converted to Christianity referred to Christians. If you get your Bible, make a little note in Acts chapter 9, Paul's uh, beating up Christians, arresting Christians, and he goes to the chief priest and he says, I want the authority to arrest anybody around. I even want to go to Damascus and bring them back if I find anybody that is living according to the way. That was how they referred to the first Christians. Jesus said in John 14, verse number 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when it come about the way, they, they, uh, they were slandering the way. So now unpause. So when it became hardened and they would not believe, they were slandering the way in front of the crowd. He, Paul, withdrew from them and he met separately with the disciples, conducting discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, so that all the inhabitants of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the message about the Lord. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. So the even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists 
attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, was doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, I recognize Paul, but who are you? The man who had the evil spirit leaped on them and overpowered them all and prevailed against them so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. And while those And while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone, so they calculated the value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. Let's read that last sentence together again. In this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. Isn't it good to know that in the worst of environments, God's message can get hearts, transform hearts, change lives. Paul said, and he was saying this about himself, Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom he was the worst. I feel, and many of you in this room feel that Jesus Christ came into the world to save me, who, me, who was about as bad as you could get in my thought life and every part of my life, I was just awful. I prayed and prayed several times, many times, after I got my life right with Jesus. Please, Jesus, please, Jesus, please, Jesus. Some people would say, you don't have to say please to Jesus. And some people say, you ain't got to cry to Jesus. But the psalmist cried a whole lot whenever he was praying. This poor saint cried to the Lord. And so I said, please, Jesus, I don't want my wife, don't want my daughter, don't want my grandkids to be nothing like me. Please, Jesus, please, Jesus, please, Jesus. And I'll just say this. I was walking around my driveway last night about 6 o'clock. And I come home and I told my wife, I says, I am blessed beyond measure. I got four grandchildren. They're all teenagers. One is at the very top end of teenager, and the other one is middle teenager. All got driver's license, and on Friday night or Saturday night at 7 p.m., every one of them is at home. Now, there's nothing wrong with going out, not anything at all, but they knew where the kids were. If they'd have been out, they'd have known. I says, thank you, Jesus. I my daughter come down to the house a little bit later on. We got a couple of cats that uh, she likes, and she was petting the cats. And I says, you know, and I related to her. I said, I am so thankful. I says, you know, Danielle, I prayed many a time that when none of my children or grandkids be anything like me. Jesus is so good, so good, so good. That was my heartbeat. It was serious about that when I first got saved. I'm still serious about it today as I pray for anybody they will eventually marry. Please, Jesus, give them somebody that is godly, that will be a strength to them. So in this way, the word of God increased and it flourished. In what way? Paul got there and the first thing he noticed among some believers, or they called themselves disciples, and they were disciples. They were disciples of John the Baptist. They, there were many of the disciples of John the Baptist. They were his disciples even after he died. They didn't come over to Christ because they didn't hear all of the message that John preached. But they heard just part of John's message about repent, repent. But they didn't listen to the whole message. But when he explained to them about John dying and John preached that Jesus would come and he preached to them about the baptism and the Holy Spirit and they received the Holy Spirit. This message today is not about me trying to get you up here to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but it is about you believing in the power of the Spirit. Many people in the church today all around the world will not want, will refuse, will not want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because people of some denomination will tell you that it's not right. 
Just read the Bible. I'm not here to argue with nobody. Not here to get with I would just tell you that Jesus Christ wants you baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's just the entrance door into where God wants to take us in this life. It was just the entrance to them. And the word of God prevailed. Jesus wants his church to be full of power. He wants us to have his glory down inside of us. Luke chapter 24, verse number 49 through 51. There one afternoon as Jesus was meeting with his disciples after he had risen from the grave right before he went up into heaven. He says, look, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But as for you, stay in the city until you are endued with power from on high. It's not just enough to know that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. It's not enough, just enough. He, he said you need to be endued. You need to have some power down inside of you. This Holy Spirit is God himself living in us. It is Jesus Christ himself living in us. Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he's not going to speak on his own, but everything that I want you to get, I'm going to give it to him and he'll give it to you. John 16, 13 through 17. Just, it's, it's there, it's there. And so... You will be empowered from a high. Then it says, and then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. <laughs> May all the blessings of God, he blessed them. He prayed over them as he began to ascend up into heaven and he went up out of their sight. And then if you read what takes place in the book of Acts, it says, while they were looking up into heaven, two angels come and says, why are you standing here? On this mountain, go back into Jerusalem and do what he told you to do. So they go back. They didn't know it would be 10 days, but it was 10 days before the Holy Spirit fell. And I don't know how many was in that initial group, but there were still 120 left on the day of Pentecost. But they were in one mind and one accord. Wait for the promise. Jesus said we would be endued with power. They didn't need anybody to tell them you're going to speak with tongues. When they were filled with the Spirit, they knew they had received the gift. And so Paul seen these disciples, and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. Jesus, give a strong command. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do you get the idea as you read this? He is like saying, get this, guys. Get this. They took it to heart when they, when they were relaying this story back to Luke. He says, and he gave us a strong demand. We knew that he was really serious about this. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift which my father promised which you have heard me speak about for John baptized with water but in a few days from now you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit I want you again I'm going to read that verse again and I want you will if you can to listen to the tone the tone that is in G has any of you ever had your mama or daddy speak to you and their tone or their voice changed or your wife spoke to you and her voice changed or your husband spoke to the wife and his voice changed. You're like, they're getting serious. Sometimes my wife will say, I tell her if she's got anything to tell me that's real important, don't tell me when my ears are turned this way and she's back there. Don't start telling me something important when you're walking out of the room and going to the bedroom. Turn around there and look at me. I'm not gifted with reading minds. <laughs> Besides, we are accused of having selective hearing anyway. So if you want to hold my feet to the fire about something, look at me. You ain't got to say now this. I ain't going to like that. But listen to the tone of this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In this is power, ability in their life. And you've heard it, and, and, you, and I'm not going to speak it again in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But you will receive power. Everybody say ability. 
ability. Ability. He gives us power. He gives us ability to do what he calls us to do. I feel the same. I have been a, a pastor for 17 years. It was 1980, the first time I stood up in front of a class to teach Sunday school. The second Sunday I taught class, I was so fearful that I sat down and I got queasy at my stomach and I walked out the back door after they prayed for me. I still feel sometimes the exact same way today. I plead with Jesus, I need that ability, I need that power. I have the Holy Spirit, but I want a double feeling. I want a refilling of God's Spirit in my soul. I want God's Spirit, I want God's Spirit, I want God's Spirit, and I want His Word down inside of me. In this way, in this way, this is how that church flourished and grew. In this way is how people got rid of their sins. In this way, this is how God did extraordinary miracles in there because Paul preached the entire gospel. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. This Spirit will destroy strongholds in your life. God spoke this word over Israel. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse number 27, Assyria was attacking Israel. And it says, and it shall come to pass that his burden Assyria. In fact, if you go back and read the story and you follow it all the way through, there was an army outside. We don't know how big the army was, but it was over 185,000 people because on the night that God destroyed them by the anointing, he sent an angel through the Assyrian army and he destroyed, killed 185,000 Assyrians. And the king woke up the next day and just had a partial army. And he took off and went back to Nineveh. But the yoke, the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We got stuff going on in our life. Fear, cussing, crack pipes, pornography, cursing, flying off the lid. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will break that yoke that comes upon your life. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Paul puts it like this in Galatians. He says, walk in the Spirit and you will not. He says, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walk in the Spirit. And so as they begin to walk in the Spirit, and it's a liberating Spirit, and people begin to get rid of their sins. You say, I can't do it. it I, I, I said a while ago, it's God coming to live in us. It's not my strength. It's his strength inside of me, inside of you. Romans 8, verse 13. Paul said, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 50,000 pieces of silver is what all that stuff was valued at. And historians are tell us and Bible commentaries tell us a piece of silver back at that time was one day's wages. So if you divide 365 into 50,000, um, 50, it comes up to 136.9 years. That's, that's a lot of money. You're not afraid to get rid of nothing when Jesus comes in and saves your life. You're not willing to, you're not, you're not, you're willing to get rid of everything. We, we, Paul said, I just started out the verse, I urge you, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, God's great grace. I don't care what you're called in, God's mercies can get us out of it. I beseech you by the mercies of God. By the mercy of Manasseh, the wickedest king that was in Israel, the wicked, the wicked, the wickedest that Judah ever had. He burned many of his own children to Molech in the fire. And he got carried off into Assyria and put into a prison. And it says in prison, he said, oh, God, forgive me. I can't explain it. But the king of Assyria, for some reason, good deal measure, I don't know. He got him out of the prison cell and took him back to Jerusalem and put him on the throne as king of Judah again. 
Go wrap your mind around that. But that's where God's grace can do a wonderful thing in our life. So filled with the Spirit, God comes and lives within us. I beseech you by the kindness and the mercies of God that we just get ready. Just lay ourselves on the altar and say, Jesus, I am all yours. The yoke will destroy it. You'll get rid of stuff and you won't want to have it again. We see in this a tenacious perseverance. Natasha, would you come? We need some, we need some grit. How many of y'all know what vice grips are? You know, you, you turn that little handle there, and you can grip something. It does pretty good, and you can pull it away. But you can pull, twist that little knob on the end to where it takes both hands just to grab that thing and mash it down. And if you've got it twisted hard enough that you can put those vice grips on that thing that takes both hands to get it locked down, you ain't likely to pull that out into the vice grips. We need to have tenacious perseverance in our life. Some people say, get, get a bite like a bulldog. If you've ever seen bulldogs lock up, you can't hardly break them apart to get you get this little short stick, and it's sort of uh, small on the end. It gets bigger, and you stick it between his jaw teeth, and you get it in there, and you pull it, and you pry it, and you get his jaw to come open, and then you can get it out of there, out of, uh, get the dogs to break up. We just need to have some bite in our decision to follow Jesus. Vice grips, that's the best one. We're not into bulldog fighting. I hope you're not. Don't tell me about it. Perseverance. And he preached the word. He preached there for three months in the church, in the synagogue. And then people began to speak against him. There's a school next door, a lecture hall. And so whatever the cost was, he rented the hall. And he sat there and he preached and preached and preached. Two years, the power of the Holy Spirit. Back to John 16, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit is really working, he'll convict of sin. He'll convict of righteousness, he'll convict of a judgment to come. But he does so much more than that. More important or just as important, it says he will magnify Jesus. As they become convicted of their sins, the Holy Spirit says, turn your eyes this way. Look upon Jesus. All that stuff that, you, that you're so convicted about, the blood of Jesus Christ, would you go, whoop, wash it away as far as the east is from the west. It's not just enough to be condemned and we got to turn to Jesus and that's what he's wanting to do. The devil will leave you condemned. He'll leave you feeling like there's no hope but the Holy Spirit will tell you there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Turn to Jesus. These people were turning to Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. This was going on and it says and they came week after week. They would bring their stuff and they would throw it and and they got a whole bunch of magic books and they built a fire and they burned them. People were being healed in extraordinary ways. First time that these kind of miracles were done wasn't any greater than what took place in Peter's life right after the day of Pentecost, after the lame man was healed. He said he walked down the street and, and, and the sun was on this side and the shadow was over here. And they would lay people in the street and people had such extraordinary faith and there was such extraordinary grace that was there. God was connecting their faith with what they were believing. And as, they, they, as Peter walked by and the shadow would hit them, whatever disease they had, they were made whole. Here, I don't know how it happened. Paul may have had a headband on, a sweat thing, and he took it off and threw it down. And somebody picked it up. They took it to somebody and the devil was cast out. 
They took it to a lame person and they were healed. God did extraordinary miracles. And in this way, the word of the Lord flourished. It happened because Paul wanted them to be filled with the full gospel, the whole power of God's spirit. And when God's spirit come into their life, he give them power, a liberating spirit. Whatever was connected in their life that was dishonorable to God, he began to get it out. He began to tell them that all scripture, all they had was the Old Testament, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You just keep reading the scriptures, keep reading the Proverbs, keep reading the law, keep reading the Psalms. You'll find out the Holy Spirit will connect you with God's living word, the sword, the sword of the spirit, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, the sword of the Holy Spirit is God's word. We read the word and the Holy Spirit said, that's for you, that's for you. So they just kept hearing the message. And in this way, the church flourished. Bible historians tell us this was the second most vile city in the Bible days, Corinth was the worst. But here God was setting people free and in this way. This morning, I would say this, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Last letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, we know we've heard this over and over again. But in verse number six, he says, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God. What is our relationship right now with Jesus? Currently, at the moment. One translation says, stir up the gift. This one says, keep the blaze of fire. prayed this morning. I said, oh God, I want your words to flow out of me and I want fire in my soul. I want fire in my heart. Not a man-made fire. Not something that I, you know, I try to work up and get good at. I want the fire of the Holy Spirit. I want the fire of the Holy Spirit permeating in this audience. This is your church, Jesus. If a man stirs you up, you won't last out the door, but if the Holy Spirit stirs you, You'll be up tomorrow morning, maybe, and the Holy Spirit saying you need to work on this. You may leave this afternoon, and the Holy Spirit says you need to work on this, and he's drawing. Second beatitude is this, blessed are they that mourn. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, and we're drawn into this place of mourning, weeping, that's actually a good place to be. It's God's invitation saying, come in. I got a more intimate relationship I want to have with you. God, I want to have a more intimate relationship with you. Keep the fire ablaze, for God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power and of love and of sound judgment. Thank you, Father. Again, the verse I open with, I urge you, I beseech you, everybody in this room, because of the generosity of God, the mercies of God, the kindness of God, the giftings of God, that we would present our bodies a living sacrifice, a lay it on the altar before you, Lord Jesus. And I won't no longer be let the world conform me and mash me, but I will be transformed. That means that I got to constantly resist this. There's nobody so saved that the devil doesn't try to get another hold on you. It's impossible. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about verse 25, 26. He says, I beat my body. I make my body my slave. Unless after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. We have to get a vice grip on our faith attach ourselves to Jesus every head bowed just for a moment